Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. Here at Frank's Bible Study, we go in-depth in God's Word, making sure we know what it is and not what we'd like it to be. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's go. So I'd like to welcome uh, everybody for uh, tonight's session. Last week we were looking at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, basically what the verse says. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So these are three things that the five offices, uh, the the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, this is what they got to transmit to the body of Christ. Of course, like I had mentioned a couple of weeks back, a lot of these offices are taken over by people that some of them don't believe in God. It's blatant. Some of them, you really got to know your scriptures to, uh, to see that. And uh, they're not feeding properly the, uh, the body of Christ. Last week we saw for the perfecting of the saints, and uh, which was the first part of Ephesians uh, 4.12. And today we're going to look at the second one, which is the work of the ministry. I'm going to give you a couple of definitions. And I want you to understand exactly what the work of the ministry is. The word ministry means the office, duties, or functions of a subordinate agent of any kind first definition that uh, Noah Webster gives is agency, service, aid, interposition, instrumentality. So the work of a ministry. So that means when you have a ministry, uh, it's a work that you're basically doing it as a subordinate. The word agency, the quality of moving or the state of being in action. The word service, in a general sense, labor of body or of body and mind. So when you're giving of your service, it could be your body or body and mind performed at the command of a superior or at the pursuance of duty for the benefit of another. In our case, we are at the command of God who is our superior. So I'm in a service. What does that mean? In a general sense, labor of body and mind, let's say for the studies that I bring to you guys, performed at the command of a superior, which is the Lord, or the pursuance of duty or the benefit of another. So I'm at his command for your benefit, for your service. The word aid, to help, to assist, to support, either by furnishing strength or means to effect a purpose or to prevent or remove evil. The person who aids or yields supports, assistant, uh, a helper. Then you've got interposition. Basically what this means is that you're sort of like the go-between, a being, placing, or coming between, an intervention. So let's say between the Lord and you, there would be me in the sense that whatever he gives me, thoughts, words, illustrations, whatever it is, this is what he wants me to communicate to you. So the Holy Spirit comes and believe me, when, when you guys are praying, believe it or not, I actually feel it. I find that for some reason, all of a sudden, the words, they start coming out smoothly. There are times it's like I'm there pick and shovel. For you Italians, pick and pala. I'm pick and shovel. It's just laborious. But eventually I do get through it. So I do a lot of praying myself. I says, okay, Lord, what word do I use here? What, how does it work? How do you want me to say it? And also the Lord helps me to deliver the message. And it has to come out in a particular way. Sometimes like it's coming out hard. I'm hitting you in the teeth. Sometimes it's coming out soft, depending on how the Lord wants you to, uh, to receive that particular word. And the last definition, instrumentality, means subordinate or auxiliary. So basically, having a ministry is being under the orders of God through the writings of the Apostle Paul. We believers have duties and functions of helping, assisting, supporting, etc. one another in the body of Christ and those who are outside of the body of Christ. Go to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. And here basically Paul tells us who our service is supposed to be to. As we have therefore opportunity, let us the believers, do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. So who do we help? Everybody, especially those of the household of faith. By doing this work of helping, assisting, supporting, etc., whatever it is that we need amongst ourselves, and also for the world out there, we are bringing good to, the, to everyone around us, believers and unbelievers. Now the work of the ministry is to be divided amongst the believers. Many think that the load of the work is laid on a pastor or the teacher. This is the furthest thing from the truth. Whatever little a believer can do, it's that much more that has been done. 
The pastor or teacher's job is to teach and instruct the saints. This is his contribution to the body of Christ. The saints are to go out and reach the lost and carry the other aspects of the ministry within the church. That is to say that each and every believer has a role or part to play in it. So it's not, for example, I speak for myself back when I used to go to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we used to go to church, we used to sit, listen, get up and leave. There's nothing that Paul had said. There was no work of the ministry. I come, penalty box, because I sinned, I go to penalty box, take the host and then go home. So there's nothing, there's nothing growth in me. But the minute now you get into a Bible study somewhere or a place where they actually believe the Bible and they're actually putting it in practice and all of a sudden say, you know what, there's something that I'd like to do and the Lord starts placing these, these things on you. It's like getting these uh, Bible studies online. The Lord will bring something on you and this is your contribution to this particular local congregation if you want. And, and in a bigger scheme of things, if we're passing out tracts and somebody gets saved, but he goes to another congregation, we did our part. We came in and we sowed some seed and somebody else now is going to start watering it. And who knows, maybe that person is going to get saved under that preacher or teacher or whatever. But at least we had a part in that. The saints are to go out and reach the lost and carry the other aspects of the ministry within the church. That is to say that each and every believer has a role and part to play in it. Someone said, shepherds don't have sheep, they tend the sheep, and the sheep reproduce. The word tend means to watch, to guard, to accompany as an assistant or protector. So what is the shepherd supposed to do? He's supposed to watch, guard, accompany as an assistant or to protect the sheep that are there. So the supposed leaders, quote unquote, and I'm using this term loosely, of your group has the protecting facet of his work towards his congregation against wolves in sheep's clothing disseminating lies falsehoods and doctrines or teachings of devils that's his business somebody is coming it's up to him to protect whatever is there at the same time this does not solely rest on the shoulders of the pastor teacher what about if this guy if i start saying something that i'm not supposed to so you guys are going to be on guard also at the same time. So an example of this is those two individuals that who came in the past few months telling us that we were wrong in what we believed, and they told us exactly what the Bible said. Remember those two guys? Okay. As your teacher, I listened intently to what they had to say. Now, I did what the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Then I followed Paul's, Paul's advice in 2 Timothy 2.15, and what did I discover when I applied these two biblical principles? You know what I discovered? I found out that both of them were freaking liars. They manipulated and twisted the Bible's original meaning by giving it an interpretation that is foreign to what the author was trying to convey to the reader. I exposed them as frauds, thus protecting you from false doctrine, because that's my job. Go to Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. What does that say? These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In that, underline this in your Bibles, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They heard with all of their ears and they searched the scriptures. It's not that they heard and it stopped there. The minute you do that, you're fried on both sides. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now question, what did Paul say studying would do? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. If you look at 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyselves approved unto God. Look at what, what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 19. For there must be also heresies among you. It's, it's natural. As the sparks fly upward, it's natural to have heresies. They're going to come in. They, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. They that have studied in your group, you're going to start seeing who they are. Question, what does Paul mean by a heresy? You need to know what a heresy is within the body of Christ, the church according to Paul. So the word heresy in a general sense, it's a fundamental error 
in religion or an error of opinion respecting some fundamental doctrine of religion. But in countries where there is an established church, an opinion is deemed heresy when it differs from that of that church. I'm going to give you an example. Example, believing that Jesus is deity or God with a capital G, it's a heresy to the Jehovah's Witness. Because within the Jehovah's Witness clan, they say that Jesus is a God small g. I come into this little group and I say, no, Jesus is God capital G. I'm coming in with a heresy within this particular group. Believing that Jesus is not Satan's brother is a heresy to the Mormons. They believe that Jesus and Satan, they were brothers. So I come into this closed group and I say, Jesus and, and Satan, they were not brothers. And that would be a heresy to they them. They would kick you out. Big time. Believing that you don't need sacraments to go to heaven is a heresy to the Roman Catholic. Believing that water baptism is not necessary for salvation is a heresy to the churches of Christ. So every church, every denomination, they have their certain things that they're actually going to stand on. And they say they have the Bible. I say I have the Bible, so I'm there. So I think we're all on an equal footing. I sit there and the guy says, no, you need to get baptized for you to be saved. Flip, flip, flip. But no, I don't, I don't need it. This is for this, this is for that. And so I come in and I says, hey, guys, uh, like this, like that. What are they going to do? They're going to grab me nice, nice, and they're going to bring me to the front door. And he says, do you see Without this address? Without searching the scripture. Without searching the scripture. And, they, and they're going to say, do you see this address here? Make sure you forget it. That means never come back here. Mm -hmm. So Noah continues his definition of heresy by saying that the scriptures being the standard of faith, any opinion that is repugnant to its doctrines is a heresy. Anything that comes contrary to scripture. You got 17 million churches, they all have Bibles, and they all claim to be standing on the Bible. But truth is exclusive. You could only have one truth. So one person is right, and all of them are wrong. But we're going to get to that. Now please notice what Noah Webster said. The scriptures being the standard of yep. faith. What does Noah Webster mean by the word standard? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you the definition. That which is established by sovereign power as a rule or measure by which others are to be adjusted. There's a standard. We look to that, and everybody adjusts themselves to this particular standard. Merriam-Webster, third definition, something established by authority, custom, or general consent as a model or example. Vocabulary.com, standard. A standard is an ideal or a set criteria that you use to judge things against. So here's a couple of examples that you can wrap your head around. Uh, what time is it? 10 to 9. 10 to 9, thank you. According to what? It's 8.50. According to what? It's uh, 8.50 according to GMT or Greenwich Mean Time. What is that? Greenwich, England is where the time zones start. So the world's time is standardized according to Greenwich, England. Greenwich, this is, this is let's say, midnight. Uh, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6, 7 o'clock. Yeah. Anyways, it goes all around the world for, for the 24 time zones. So if somebody says, yeah, but wait a minute, you give me 11.30, but I've got uh, 3.45. Yeah. One of us is wrong. What do we do? We're going to go back to the standard. We're going to go back to the standard, and the standard says, and over here it's here, your time should be 11.30. So I'm sorry, buddy, but you're wrong. So you can't say, well, we have to agree to disagree. Now... There are two standards when it comes to temperature and measurements. Fahrenheit and Celsius, I'm sure you all heard about that, for temperature, and imperial and metric for measurements. A country will adopt only one of its modes of calculating either temperature or uh, measurement. But these are standards. So if I say that this is three feet, take out any measuring tape you want, that is the standard. And why do they set a standard? To avoid confusion. Very well said. There is more confusion in the body of Christ than in any other religion. It is incredible. Without standards, there would be mass confusion and chaos. As we have seen these standards to help us keep everything in order, the Bible should be the standard for all matters of faith and morality. Again, in 1 Corinthians 11.19, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may, may be made manifest among you. When these heresies come within the body of Christ, you will know who studied within the group. 
And those who have studied the Word are going to flush out these heresies. Mm -hmm. I need to get all of you or anybody that's a student of Scripture, that's a disciple of Jesus Christ, to the point where you can start flushing these people out. And by the way, from my research up to now, I found that the word study is to be found only in the authorized version. That's the King James Version of the Bible. Listen to everybody and what they have to say about God, religion, the Bible. And don't stop there. You need to go back and search the scriptures whether those things are so. You're doing that for yourself. Know what you believe. What do you believe? Where did it come from? Where should you be getting your belief from? Was the info given to you right? Was it scripturally based? As I mentioned at the beginning of the study, what you do believe, what do you believe, and where did you get it from? Most of our beliefs comes from other people. Were they right in what they said? Did you check it out yourself? You are the only person responsible for that belief system. You're responsible for whatever your belief is. You can't blame somebody else. And if the guy was wrong, change the belief. Just dump him like a hot potato and just go somewhere else. The truth is out there. We need to search it. Now, once you stand on your belief or truth, it will be challenged. Trust me, people will come out of the woodwork. People from under those rocks, they're going to come out. They're going to be challenging you. And like I said before, truth does not fear examination. God is a God of truth, and truth does not fear examination. You think you have the truth? Not a problem. Let's put it to the test. If a religious organization or church or even a teaching you've been taught or what you invented in your head cannot stand up under proper biblical examination, it is not. Bold it, underline it. It is not the truth, but is rather a counterfeit. For truth is exclusive, and loyalty to a counterfeit is disloyalty to the Lord God of the Bible, whom you say you are following. Does that make sense? When a religion claims exclusive rights over the truth, meaning that they are the only ones that have it, it's time for you to pack your bags and take off. If I believe my car is the fastest vehicle in the streets, I will not back down for any challenge. You think your car is fast? Absolutely. You want to test it against mine? Absolutely. Let's go. Because in the end, only one car will win. If I believe my Bible doctrine is solid, I will not back down for any challenge or from any challenge or any debate. I am ready at all times. Mm -hmm. Whatever scriptural truth you have, make sure it's in biblical context. A text taken out of its context without its co-text, the matching verses, is a pretext. For somebody that doesn't know the scriptures, hey, wow, that sounds pretty good. Oh, that sounds very spiritual. No, I feel it. I feel it inside me. Yeah, I, I feel that that's the truth on what you're feeling. And let's say you were drunk. What feeling did you get when you were drunk? Be very careful about your feelings. So the shepherd's work is to expose these lies, falsehoods, and doctrines and teachings of devils to protect the body of Christ. Getting back to the work of the ministry Paul speaks about in Ephesians 4.12 involves every facet of that group to edify it. Everybody does something to edify somebody else. Somebody will do something that will bring pleasure or relief or whatever it is to somebody else in the group. So basically, the work of the ministry that all members in the body of Christ are engaged in is to be in service to others. This is one of the main things that we have. Now, it involves you expending of your time, your energy, and placing the needs of others first. Before you go off conquering the world, you have personal responsibilities to tend to first, being yourself or you may have a family. In my understanding, this comes first. You've got to take care of yourself, because once you're well taken care of, then you can go out there and do the work that you have to do. Once my family is well taken care of and I have an extra 10 minutes, you know what? I can offer you 10 minutes. I got an hour, I can offer you one hour. But I make sure that my house is in order. I make sure that everything in my house is okay. We are there to help each other. But there are certain priorities. There are certain responsibilities that comes first. Whatever time and resources you have left, devoted to the Lord by helping others. So, part of the five offices Paul speaks about, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, were to train others to serve. 
So here are some examples of large church ministries. One of them was a music ministry. It all having to do with the music when believers come together. So there's a practice at such and such a night. We're going to be practicing with the band. We're going to be practicing the songs for next service uh, singing. Sunday school, the teaching of diverse topics from children to adults. You need a teacher there. And if the teacher is going to be there, he has to spend time going over the material. You're dealing with kids. How do you speak and how do you will and deal with kids? You're dealing with teens. How do you speak and will and deal with teens? You're speaking with adults. How do you speak and will and deal with them? So these are all different ways. I can't come into a five, six year old and talk to them the way I'm talking to you right now. Mm -hmm. I got to bring down the level of my conversation so they'll, they'll be able to understand. Evangelism, the preaching of the gospel to your neighbor and their churches that they basically go around their neighborhoods evangelizing their neighbors. I really like this one, Married Life Couples Ministry. And this one said, help you grow in your marriage. We have put together a plan to help you make time for one another. Learn God's design for your marriage. Learn practical skills for building your marriage on purpose. And join other couples on the, on the journey or their journey of building a healthy marriage. Our passion is to quit it. Our passion is to equip couples to live out their, the five marriage essentials. Basically, honor, relational intimacy, spiritual intimacy, partnership, or message to others. Greeters, to help those who visit a particular congregation with a friendly welcome. You need somebody at the door. The preacher can't be there because he's probably in the back either praying, going over his notes, making sure that he's going to be taking care of his part while somebody's in the front. Maintenance ministries. To maintain Lake Forest campus buildings and grounds in pristine conditions so our ministries and community will be drawn to beauty and the peacefulness of our property. We seek volunteers who want to use their gifts and abilities to help maintain our church campus and help prepare for special events, campaigns, activities that require unique technical, electrical or mechanical skills or features. Kids small groups. To help kids understand and develop a relationship with God through fun and engaging group activities. Uh, so Kids Small Groups is a midweek discipleship program for the children of Saddleback Church in a pre-K through grade 6, working through the journey, quote-unquote, our discipleship curriculum. Your child will focus on developing a relationship with Jesus Christ, learning what it means to be part of the church family, and connecting with their peers and leaders. You mean to tell me the schools that do this? These are churches that do this, yes. Oh, okay, churches. These are churches, yeah. So basically a ministry is the helping out or the giving of yourself, of your time and efforts, energy and talents. It is the assisting and supporting of the different work that has to be done in the group where you meet or to others that are around you. So now we're going to be looking for the edifying of the body of Christ. The definition of edifying means building up in Christian knowledge. Again, Noah Webster. Building up in Christian knowledge, instructing, improving the mind. When there's an edification happening in the body of Christ, there's a building up of knowledge. Oxford Dictionary, edifying, providing moral or intellectual instruction. So to instruct or improve someone morally or intellectually. Vocabulary.com. The original meaning of edify, back in one of the original meanings, was to build. And things that are edifying build up a person, especially in an intellectual or moral way. Mm -hmm. So edifying applies to things that help you become a better person. A wise saying is edifying. Proverb. A powerful documentary might be edifying. You might have learned something. The words of a good teacher are often edifying. Macmillan Dictionary. Edifying. Teaching you something that increases your knowledge or improves your character. Edification was Paul's heartbeat throughout his letters. He wanted all believers to have this same edifying mindset. Edification is one of the foundational pillars of the body of Christ. Paul was constantly hammering away to keep the believer ever mindful of this edification for one another. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll look at two verses, 12 and 26. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that he may excel to the edifying of the church. In verse 26, How is it then, brethren? So he's talking to the believers in Corinth. And he's saying, When ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done 
unto edifying. Okay, so I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and, underline it, edify one another, even as also ye do. Go to Romans now, chapter 14 and verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. What is it that you can bring that you can actually edify somebody else? This is the mindset, the heartbeat that Paul had. This is what he was trying to basically deliver to all of the saints. And this is something that we have to have today. As the definition states, edifying builds a person by providing moral or intellectual instruction, teaching you something that increases your knowledge or improves your character. Wasn't this what Paul was doing? His letters to the church was mainly to encourage and edify. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Your affection, what is it on? Your houses, your cars, your boats, your furs, your jewelry, whatever it is. Is that where your affection is? But look at what Paul is saying. He's edifying you. He's building you. He wants to build your character. He wants to increase your knowledge. Okay? Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Look at 5 now. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And the children of disobedience are those who don't know God, those who reject God's gift of grace. These are the children of disobedience. You are now saved. Now you are a child of, of uh, you were a child of disobedience. Okay? Verse 7. In the which ye also walked in some time, when ye lived in them, past tense, but now, that you're saved, ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You see what Paul is doing? Guys, you used to be like this, I want you to be like this. Guys, you used to be this dirty, I want you to wash up and I want you to look like this. You put off the old man, you put on the new man. He wants to teach us something that increases our knowledge and improves our character. Uh, he wants to provide moral and intellectual instruction for us. Now, Paul is providing moral or intellectual instructions to the believers in Christ. Look at verse 11. Where there is neither Greek or nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now between 12 and 17 now. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing in one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Do you see the edification that he just gave the people that are in Colossae? Turn to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. We'll start with these two verses. Mm -hmm. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. The word lust isn't necessarily a bad word. Lust means, the first definition, to desire eagerly or to long for. Lust becomes a bad word when you eagerly desire something that is not lawful for you to have, to do, or to think. That's when lust picks up a negative connotation. 
But lust in itself is a neutral word. So to greatly desire something, as in this case, the flesh greatly desires that you would give in to its appetites, and the spirit greatly desires that you would walk in the spirit. So these two are fighting against each other. These desires are contrary the one to the other. One of these desires is stopping you from doing what you would. Remember, Paul is speaking to the believers in Christ, not to the world, in this section that we're going to be looking at. Example, if you are being led of your flesh to indulge in carnal appetites like sex, drugs, alcohol, food, whatever it is that your flesh is crying out for, but your spirit is pulling you the other way for you not to do it, you are not doing the things that you want to do at that moment. If you're being led of the Spirit to indulge in its fruits of love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, etc., or whatever the Spirit is crying out for, but your flesh is pulling you the other way to indulge in its carnal appetites. So now you're not doing what you wanted to do because the flesh is pulling you away from the Spirit. The other way, the Spirit is pulling you away from, from the flesh. So they're basically lusting against each other. This is the fight that we're going through. That's why Paul says in, um, what is it, Romans 7, 8, he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those things I do it. Yet it is no more, no more I that do it, but sin, sin that dwells in my flesh. So there's, there's that constant battle. The Spirit wants you to walk in joy, love, gentleness, temperance. He wants you to walk in there. Your flesh is saying, hmm, forget that. This is where I want you to go because it's going to make me feel good. So let's get back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 18 now. We just covered 16, 17, 18 through 25. But if ye be led of the Spirit. Notice the word if. If ye confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in, your, in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The if depends on you. There's a choice that you have to make. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. This is not a complete list. There's many more that you can add to this. Yeah. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let, let us also walk in the Spirit. And again, for those of you taking notes, I want you to write this thought in the margin of Galatians 5.16. In your Bibles or in your notebooks, whatever notes you're taking. Two forces surge within my breast. One is foul, the other blessed. One I love, the other I hate. The one I feed will dominate. Are you feeding your carnal side, your carnal pleasures, or are you feeding your spirit? The one that you spend most time in with is the one that's actually going to dominate.